This is my first Sunday back in the pulpit since we began live streaming our services to our tapestry and Baroque campuses. And so I want to begin by sharing a greeting to the members of our congregation who are worshiping with us in Richmond, Texas. You'll note that I did not extend my greeting to Spring, Texas. Those of you who have read your email, you may have heard by now that the Tapestry Campus has decided to go its own way. First Church is no longer providing them with Sunday morning worship services. And this shift is a significant one for First Church. It means that once the board takes action, you will no longer be one church in three locations. I have to say that I think it's a healthy transition. In the five and a half months that I've been the interim minister, I have to say that the tapestry has never felt integrated into the life of First Church. They wanted to maintain a separate identity, including their own logo, website, and social media. And they've never been excited about receiving the Sunday morning worship services from the Museum District campus. So I think it's best to bless them and wish them the best in their efforts to grow Unitarian Universalism. They might be going their own way, but we all remain Unitarian Universalists. We all remain part of the same project of building Unitarian Universalism in the greater Houston area. I'd say that my experience with Thoreau has been quite the opposite of my experience with Tapestry. I experienced Tapestry in museum, or Thoreau and Museum District as increasingly integrated. The shift to live streaming is further solidifying the connections between the two campuses. For those of you who do not know, live streaming means that at about the same time, folks here at the Museum District campus are listening to the sermon. Another 50 or 60 people are joining with us virtually in our new sanctuary in Richmond. We've been live streaming services now for about four weeks. And I've been here in Museum District not leading the services, but present. And after each of the services, I've had a chance to interact with members who attend the row. And we were able to talk about that week's sermon, which made me feel more like the minister of one church than I had in the past. Because we shared an immediate, common experience, a recent, recent shared experience of worship. And a shared experience of worship is at the heart of congregational life. You can find all sorts of ministers and theologians and other scholars who tell us this in some fashion or another. Take one, the late Harvard Divinity School professor, Conrad Way. He observed, a church must have some element or elements of common experience shared by its members to unite them and make a community out of a collection of individuals. The theme we're examining in worship this month is transformation. The process of creating a religious community out of a group of individuals is a transformative process. It changes our individual identities. Together we become Unitarian Universalists. Together we become the first Unitarian Universalist Church of Houston. And in this becoming, my sense of self shifts. The perceiving I, the Colin, who is giving you this sermon, is a different self than I would have if I was part of a different religious community. And the same is true of the perceiving you, the, each of you sitting in the pews, gathering together as a religious community, changes us. But that's the point, is it not? Most of us want to be part of a religious community because we feel like our life would not be complete without one. Yesterday, we had a new member class. Like no, most new member classes I've been involved with for the last decade or so, uh, we invited people interested in joining the congregation to share a little bit about their personal religious journeys. What brought you here, we asked them. The details of the story are, of course, confidential, so I'm not going to share them. But I can reflect that upon the themes that emerge from the stories. And one theme stood out, as it so often does when I ask people why they come to a Unitarian Universalist congregation. It runs something like this. You felt like there was something missing from your life. You were unhappy with the stilted or confining theology of other religious communities you've been part of. 
Maybe they did not welcome you because of your sexual orientation or your gender identity. Maybe you did not resonate with their teachings about hell and damnation. Maybe you wanted a more capacious tradition, one that allowed for room for doubt and dissent, one that welcomed, even encouraged you uh, to, after you realized you were an atheist or an agnostic. And so you started doing some research, or you met someone from this congregation, or your friend or relative found Unitarian Universalism, and you discovered that this community was a place where you felt like you belonged. For a long time, I was a Unitarian Universalist without knowing it. It almost always gets said during these new member classes by somebody. Occasionally, there's someone like me who was raised Unitarian Universalist who participates in such a class, and their story has a slightly different spin might go like this. You grew up a Unitarian Universalist in another city. Unitarian Universalism has always been an important part of your life. Taught you that critical thinking is essential. Taught you that the most powerful force in the world is love. Taught you that the pursuit of justice, the work of building beloved community, is at the heart of what it means to be a religious person. To paraphrase Rebecca Parker, it provided you with a place where you felt accepted in all of your humanity. The stories share a common thread. Your participation in a Unitarian Universalist community has changed, is changing you, is helping you to become a more authentic person. When you join a Unitarian Universalist congregation, you enter, as Parker puts it, a sanctuary for the recovery of soul, and a school for the transformation of society. Alternatively, when you join a Unitarian Universalist congregation, you commit to the intertwined projects of individual and collective liberation, or as, some, uh, or as we might think of it, individual and collective transformation. My sermon title this morning gets to a key tension point in this enterprise, where to begin. The ancient Greek philosopher Protagoras once observed, there are two sides to every question. My question might be approached while thinking about his wisdom. When we are sinking transformation, should we begin as individuals or should we begin as a collective? Four observations as we consider this question. The first, transformation requires intentionality. The second, transformation is an individual project. The third, transformation is a collective project. And the fourth, real transformation manifests itself in our daily lives. Let's start with the first of these observations. Transformation requires intentionality. I suspect this is something you already know. We just rang in the new year. And what do so many of us typically do at New Year's, we make resolutions. Just a show of hands, how many of you out there made New Year's resolutions? I did. I do every year. In fact, I make some of the same resolutions <laughs> every year. I'm going to spend a little more time meditating. I'm going to be better about going to the gym. I'm going to lose five pounds. Do not ask me why it is five pounds. For the past six years, I've been trying to lose five pounds. For the past six years, my weight has remained exactly the same. What about you? Do you have resolutions that you return to year after year? If you do, the point is not to make yourself feel bad. The point is to remind us that transformation is difficult work and that it requires us to be intentional about our actions. This leads me to my second observation. Transformation is an individual project. It involves changing our behavior in some way. The best way I know how to do this is to nurture a religious discipline, what some of us call a spiritual practice. This might be prayer, meditation, tai chi, or yoga. How many of you out there have a regular spiritual practice? It's good. I do, and I would say that if you don't, I highly recommend it. 
Now, myself, I'm a steadfast practitioner of that old Puritan and transcendentalist spiritual practice, journal writing. I have a regular writing routine. It begins with reading. Most days I begin the day by reading three things. A sermon or a text about preaching, three or four pages of poetry, and a bit of scripture from one of the world's religious traditions. And then I write in my journal for 15 minutes. This week I've been reading Otis Moss's The Third's Blue Note Preaching in a Post-Soul World, an anthology of traditional Japanese poetry and proverbs from the Hebrew Bible. Each of these has opened up my experience of the world in some way. Otis Moss the Third pushes us to remember that preaching and worship, the collective work that we are part of right now, that we're engaged in at this moment, has to wrestle with the tragedies of the world if it is going to be meaningful. At the same time, we need to celebrate beauty and joy. Moss is the senior minister of Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago, where Barack Obama used to be a member. He writes, Blue note preaching, or preaching with blues sensibilities, is a prophetic preaching, preaching about tragedy, but refusing to fall into despair. When I read this passage, I'm reminded that if preaching is to be authentic, it has to do the work of transformation, of transforming what is in the world, of confronting the earthly powers and principalities with a higher vision. I must point out that the federal government shutdown is a manufactured crisis, a temper tantrum created by a political leader who is not getting his way, a political leader who does not care about 800,000 federal employees who are being harmed by a decision to shut down the government. And I must point out that real leadership is found in those who care about all people. And that when we remember that we can find beauty, we remember this, and that when we remember this, we can find beauty and joy in this troubled world. It's not present when we look to the fuel, fools who create political crisis. It's found in the ways we care for each other and create community in the midst of crisis. And so I'll say again what Carolyn said during the announcements, if you're a federal employee, and if you're impacted by the shutdown, if you're having trouble paying your bills, come see me and First Church will do what we can to assist you. The sections of Proverbs I've been reading this for the past week is devoted to pairing antithetical ideas, much like Blue Note preaching. The rather than calling us to find beauty in tragedy, Proverbs contrasts the wise and the foolish. Some of its ver verses speak to our present situation. The tongue of the righteous man is choice silver, but the mind of the wicked is of little worth. Or what the wicked man plots overtakes him. The righteous desire is granted. When the storm passes, the wicked man is gone. But righteousness is an everlasting foundation. I actually left my reflection on traditional Japanese poetry to the end because several of you have been asking about my trip to Japan. And well, some of my daily spiritual practice figures into my story about my trip. The anthology I've been reading features the work of two of the central figures in Japanese literature, the poets Basho and Busan. They came to me one night when I was in Kyoto. Well, actually, they opened the world to me a little bit in Kyoto. I've been wandering the streets of the ancient former capital for the whole day. I was tired and wending my way slowly through the dense streets of hyper-neon and ancient buildings, and I thought about stopping for a drink. And there it was, a sign in kanji, which I do not read at all, and the English word jazz, and an arrow pointing up a flight of stairs. Art Blakely, Horace Silver, Nina Simone, Ella Fitzgerald, Gregory Porter fan that I am, I followed the sign and found myself in a Japanese jazz bar. And it was not devoted to live music. Rather, it was a place where one could go and listen to vinyl records. There were thousands of them crammed into a place that seated maybe 16 people. 10 at the bar, six at a little open booth. 60s bebop was playing. 
I placed my order and opened a novel I had brought with me, Strange Weather in Tokyo by Hiromi Kawakami. And then soon after that, it happened. A man and a woman came in. They glanced at me suspiciously, asked in English what I was reading, recognized and praised the author, and then somehow in their broken English and in my non-existent Japanese, we constructed a conversation about Japanese literature, a subject I know the barest bit about. But it was when I mentioned that I had read Basho and Busan that the conversation took its turn. Till then, they had viewed me with generous hesitation. But somehow I could recognize Basho's frog poem when they recited it to me in Japanese. Do you know it? An old pond, the sound of a diving frog. And they gave me a little busan. I'm not exactly certain which poem, but it may have been this one. Fuji all alone, the one thing left unburied by new green leaves. And so there we were, talking about literature and art and jazz, and soon about what I needed to do while I was in Kyoto. And it turns out that David Bowie's favorite place in the world was in Kyoto. It's an old Zen temple called Sojenji, a little bit outside of the city. And they promised me that if I went to it, I would find it, well, quiet. The next day, I found myself taking a bus 45 minutes outside of the city center. I walked through a bamboo grove. There was practically no one there. The quiet was, well, the quiet was almost all consuming. The leaves barely spoke. The wind did not seem to blow. The sound of no sound. Up some stairs I climbed, and into the temple I went. I was there for almost two hours. There may be ten people who came in while I was there. First, sitting on the veranda, overlooking the 800-year-old Zen garden. Three groups of perfectly sculptured bushes. Three, then five, then seven. In short, front of a short white wall framed by a mountain. Next, wandering through the temple, looking at hundred-year-old paintings on the walls, paintings of nature scenes, and finally, sitting on the veranda again. Now, I'm not sure if that experience itself changed me or transformed me, but what I know is that my daily practice of reading poetry opened up that unexpected temple to me. It's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen, and it renewed my confidence that people can create and sustain beauty across the generations. This brings me to my third observation, transformation is collective work. My experience in Sojen was my experience alone, but it was actually a significant collective undertaking. The temple had to be maintained for 800 years, that's more than 30 generations. Without the collective efforts of thousands of unknown people across time, my own experience would not have been possible. The collective effort formed the opportunity for me to have the experience of renewal that I had at that temple. It is also a collective effort, this work of worship, that turns us from individuals into the community that we call the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Houston when we sit in the pews together, when we sing together, when we listen to the sermon or to the special music, we share an experience of being a community together. And through this experience, we actually come to know each other. We come to be in sync with each other. This is especially true when we sing a hymn. When we sing, we find ourselves breathing together. We find ourselves in rhythm together. And that's an experience of knowing each other in a way that unites us, that is hard to describe. But 
Our opening hymn, 346, actually tries to make this argument. Come sing a song with me. I'd like to invite you to turn to your hymnal to 346 and sing again with me the first verse. Come sing a song with me. Come sing a song with me. Come sing a song with me. That I might know you. And I bring you home when hope is hard to find. And I'll bring a song of love and rose in the winter time. I want us to think about the words of that song for a moment. It's an invitation to join a community. Come, sing a song with me. It's an invitation to share the self with another, that I might know your mind. It's a suggestion that together we can undergo a process of transformation. I'll bring you hope when hope is hard to find. It's actually a promise about how we might live together. If we join together in song, put ourselves in sync, as the song suggests, we can change ourselves and transform the world. We can find hope even when we find despair, feel despair, Discover winter roses. Hear the song of love. Remembering that we can come to a place where we can find hope and a song of love in a world filled with turmoil is something that can transform our lives. Gives us the strength to carry on when otherwise we cannot carry on. This brings me to my final observation about transformation. Real transformation is most evident in the ways we live our daily lives. It's in the way we engage in a regular religious discipline or spiritual practice, and in that engagement shifts our understanding of the self, slowly, day by day, year by year, decade by decade. It's the way in which a being part of a religious community changes our weekly habits. Rather than belonging to the church of sleeping in or early Sunday brunch, we devote ourselves to the project of collective liberation and self-transformation. Instead of making our way alone, we join in a covenant with other members of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Houston to, in Rebecca Parker's words, break through silence and in great laughter shake the foundations of the world's structures of denial and exclusion. Instead of giving ourselves over to despair, we just struggle, in the words of the great Shanti Dakota poet, John Trudell, taking each day, one at a time, the mending and the breaking, creating patterns for our life. We struggle knowing that transformation is about shifting the patterns of our lives, patterns that change slowly as we pursue a religious discipline, the patterns that change slowly as we are part of religious community, the patterns that are evident in the ways in which we orient our lives towards the great projects of self-transformation and collective liberation. So where to begin? With individual transformation or collective transformation? I suspect that it matters little for both are bound up in the other. Transformation, the work of the community, Transformation, a project that requires rigorous attention, a commitment to be transformed. Transformation, an individual project, something we pursue on our own, seeking to shift, to open up the self. Transformation, a collective project that requires the work of many. Transformation, a daily project whose evidence can become written in the very flesh of our lives. Transformation. This Sunday, as we conclude our sermon, let us open ourselves up to the possibilities. Let us commit to reconnect with our individual religious disciplines or to learn new ones. Let us sing the song together. Let us bring each other hope. 
Let us share the song of love. Let us remember that it is through such actions that we can transform ourselves and our world. Let the congregation say, 